To give you a quick look at many of the newer interesting languages that have gained traction recently, we're going to implement the same simple program in all of them to quickly tease out some of the interesting similarities and differences. At the end, we're going to give out three awards, one for most concise language, one for coolest language feature, and one for language most people probably haven't tried but would probably enjoy. Some might say you can't compare apples and oranges, but in this video, we're going to compare apples with oranges, pizza, forklifts, and chainsaws. Some of these languages are very different from Rust, but what they all have in common is a vibrant community and a decent amount of momentum. So hang on to your stuffed Ferris, we're going to compare Rust to seven other languages that you probably haven't tried. Each and every one of these seven languages gave me a different surprise that I didn't see coming. The program we're going to implement reads a line of space delimited numbers from standard input and prints a sum of those numbers. It's a simple program, but one that quickly surfaces the idiosyncrasies of a programming language. We'll start things off right by looking at Rust first. We'll create the Rust project with cargo new sum underscore project. When people talk about Rust, you usually hear things about memory safety, great performance, blah, blah, blah. Rust doesn't often get enough credit for its beautiful, concise way of creating infinite loops. In most languages, you have to specify a loop with a predicate like while true, but in Rust, you can simply say loop and you have yourself an infinite loop. The code to actually read from standard in is a bit more verbose than some languages. We have to create a mutable string called buffer, then call standard in dot readline with buffer as the argument. This returns a result, so we'll unwrap that. To tokenize a string based on whitespace, we'll call split underscore whitespace, then collect, convert it to a vector. We'll create a function called sum underscore function that takes a vector of string slices and returns an i32. We'll implement it in a declarative functional style using the map and sum functions. The map function takes an anonymous function as a parameter, which takes one parameter and returns a value. We surround the parameter of the anonymous function with bar characters, then write the body of the function immediately after, which calls dot parse on the element to parse it to an i32. We'll unwrap it since we're not doing any error handling, then call dot sum to get the sum of all the parse elements. Then we'll call sum underscore function, passing in the splits vector. Finally, we call the print line macro to print it out. That's Rust. Now let's move on to some languages that might be less familiar. The next language is Nim. Nimble is the package manager in Nimland, so we'll create the Nim project using Nimble in its sum underscore project. The syntax of Nim is definitely inspired quite a bit by Python. Scopes can be defined using whitespace, and many of the keywords are the same. But unlike Python, it's statically typed. One really interesting thing about Nim is that it allows a developer to choose a memory management strategy. Usually languages are tied to one memory management strategy since it has implications around how you need to write your code. Nim is the first language that I've seen where memory management strategy is largely decoupled from the language. You can choose from many options, ranging from manual memory management like C to reference counting to more traditional garbage collection. Nim has a data structure called a sequence that are kind of like slices and rust, so we'll have our sum function take one of those as its parameter. We'll call dot map on the sequence and pass in an anonymous function that parses a string to an integer. Nim has something called templates, which are roughly equivalent to Rust's macros. They can take an arbitrary Nim expression and expand it into some other block of code that winds up getting compiled. We'll invoke a template called fold left, which is an operation that is popular in functional languages that allows us to describe how to combine elements in the collection together. In this case, we pass it the expression a plus b, which will ultimately give us the sum of the entire array. Another language with syntax inspired by Python is Julia. Julia has a package manager built into its REPL called PKG. To create a project, enter the REPL by executing Julia, then press right bracket to enter PKG. From there, you can do generate sum underscore project to create the project. While its syntax is pretty close to Python, it is known to have much better performance, which makes it a popular alternative to Python for data science applications. Like Python, it's dynamically typed with optional type annotations. It is a bit different from Python in that it actually doesn't leverage whitespace for scoping. Instead, you'll see keywords like n that denote the end of a scope. We'll make our sum function that takes one parameter called splits, and we can add a type if we wish by postfixing it with a double colon, and then the type, which in this case is a vector of substrings. A substring is kind of like a string slice in Rust. To run the project, we'll do julia source slash sum.jl. Elixir is one of the functional programming languages that we'll be looking at. Mix is a package manager in the Elixir ecosystem, so we'll do mix new sum underscore project to create the project. In Elixir, variables are immutable and there are no loops. To run some code more than once, you need to use recursion. That can feel a little awkward at first. The thing that I thought was really interesting about Elixir is the pipe operator, which is kind of a really concise way of doing dot map, sort of. Basically, it takes the return value of the function on the left and automatically passes it as the first argument to the function on the right. Unlike .map, the underlying type doesn't have to be a monadic container. This is actually one of the nicest language features I discovered while making this video. To actually run the program, I had to load the module into the Elixir REPL by doing IEX-S mix. 
then run some module.io underscore loop. Elixir experts, feel free to drop a comment if there's an easier way to do this. Next up is Zig. Zig shares quite a few keywords and syntax with Rust. To create the project, we'll make the directory, then CD into it, and then run zig init-exe. Zig has compiled the machine code and has no garbage collector. One of its key tenants is to have no hidden control flow, and it achieves this by not having things like operator overloading, exceptions, or macros. It's statically typed with no garbage collector, giving it a great upper bound for performance. It does not attempt to check for memory safety at compile time like Rust does, so it's more like C and C++ in that sense. People tend to say they fight the bar checker when learning Rust. During my first attempt at Zig, I found myself fighting the type checker quite a bit, primarily because I was trying to have an iterator as a parameter for the sum underscore nums function, and parameters in Zig are always const, so you can't really use an iterator that's passed in by value, so you have to use a mutable pointer instead, and yeah, that turned out to be a bit of a rabbit hole. One thing that surprised me is that at the time this video is being made, Zig does not support anonymous functions. So you can't really sum up the array of strings in a declarative way, using dot map and dot sum or dot fold like you can in other languages. Speaking of strings, Zig doesn't have an explicit string type. Strings are actually represented as arrays using unsigned bytes, a little bit like C. The Zig implementation of this program turned out to be more verbose than all the rest. There's probably some things that I could have done better to make it more concise. Zig experts, please feel free to light me up in the comments. I was actually really impressed by the Haskell implementation of the program. To make the project, we'll do a make dir and then cd into the directory. Cabal is the go-to package manager in Haskell, so then you do cabal in it. Haskell is notable for being one of the purest functional languages. We define our main function by doing main equals, then we create a do block in which we put our code that interacts with standard in and standard out. Anything in the do block is basically run imperatively, but anything outside of that, like our sum function, is purely functional. There aren't any curly braces in Haskell, and parentheses aren't necessary when calling a function. In my opinion, this makes the code very aesthetically pleasing and concise. There are no loops in Haskell, so at the end of the main function, we just have to make a recursive call to itself, which effectively makes the program a read eval print loop. The dollar sign operator is basically a way to enclose the entire right side of the line in parentheses. This can make things quite a bit less messy than a bunch of nested parentheses. Haskell is statically typed, but function type signatures are actually optional. I've omitted them for this implementation just because I was in awe at the brevity. Seriously, check out how concise this is. To run the project, we'll do cabal run. Lua is a little out of place in this video in that it's the only one of these languages designed to be used inside applications to make them more extensible. Lua is relatively straightforward to learn and it feels a bit like Python both in terms of its syntax and simplicity. But it's different from Python in that white space and indentation level aren't used to control scopes. Outside of string literals, white space is actually mostly ignored by the Lua interpreter. No semicolons are required at the end of each line and curly braces aren't used to designate scopes. Instead, keywords are used to designate the start and end of scopes, for example, the word end is used quite often. To run our Lua script, we can do Lua sum.lua. Crystal draws its syntax primarily from Ruby, which is a pretty well-loved language. But Ruby isn't exactly known as the most performant language, it's dynamically typed, and all variables are implicitly knowable, which is also known as the billion dollar mistake. Crystal is compiled to machine code for better performance, it's statically typed, and it removes implicit nullability. It does still use a garbage collector, so that's going to put a bit of an upper bound on performance though. The syntax is so close to Ruby that it seems like the main differences are related to static type and explicit nullability. I was really impressed with how concise the program turned out when written in Crystal. It's important to note that this isn't really an ultra fair comparison. Each of these languages caters to a specific need and in a sense, we're comparing them in a way that some might consider surface level. But you do need to look at the surface at some point. Here are the awards I'm going to give out after trying all these languages. The most concise language goes to Haskell. That one wasn't even close. For the coolest language feature, I could probably pick something from Haskell or Elixir here, but I'm gonna have to go with Elixir's pipe operator. The language that most people probably haven't tried that they would probably like, Crystal and Nim are the joint winners. Their syntax is incredibly concise, clean, and both are statically typed. Now, has my love for Rust waned after looking at all these languages? It hasn't. Actually, none of these other languages attempt memory safety with no garbage collection. If you're new to Rust, make sure to check out my video Rust Demystified, which will quickly get you past the most challenging parts of Rust. I mentioned none of these other languages attempt memory safety with no garbage collection, though I might have discovered one that does. Maybe we'll look at that one next. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.